All right, so uh, let me thank everybody for coming. Today, it's a great pleasure to introduce Igor Klebanov from Princeton. Igor received his PhD from Princeton and spent a couple of years in the theory group of Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. And since 1989, he is a permanent professor at Princeton, where he is currently the director of the Princeton Center for Theoretical Studies uh, Sciences. Um, Igor is very well known for his work in string theory and uh, uh, quantum field theory, especially in the regime of strong coupling. His uh, early work as a student um, of uh, lattices of skirmions was one of the first, or maybe the first one in, in the series to, to address the question of uh, hadrons, baryons in, in um, high density phase. Like Expect in uh, neutron steel and matrix model descriptions of strings and um, you know, studies of deep brains, which eventually culminated in the discovery of ADS CFD correspondence. So, together with Steve Gopser and uh, Alexander Eager, is the author of one of the three fundamental foundational papers of ADS CFD correspondence. And it should be also mentioned that his er earlier work was an important precursor to the ADS CFD correspondence. So, in the post ADS CFD, uh, world, uh, Igor continued to develop the, this, uh, this duality and uh, contributed a number of uh, important results. And uh, I'd like to mention one, which is the discovery of cascading gauge theory, which is uh, an example of a gauge theory with uh, unconventional RG behavior, but also importantly, uh, an interesting example of uh, uh, confinement in, in gauge theories. And he also contributed in my studies of G a high spin theories and their connections to ADS safety correspondence, uh, entanglement, uh, F theorem, and uh, quantum field the and field theory methods for uh, critical behavior. Uh, so recently he's coming back to the origins and to the question of confinement in gauge theory. So today he'll give his perspective uh, on this problem, talk about connections with strings and uh, lower dimensional gauge theory. So thank you very much, Igor, for being here with us. And uh, without taking any more of your, of your time, I'll pass the word to you. OK, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Yeah, I'm happy to be giving this remote talk, uh, remote better than no talk. So, so let me uh, go back to... Uh, Right. So the <clears throat> so this is uh, the title of of the talk, and uh, uh, I understand that it's a colloquium style talk. So I'm afraid that to many of you, much of it will be familiar. But uh, I hope that at the end I'll give some uh, some idea what I've been working on more recently. And. Uh, Okay, so so first, just a very general story about string theory. We of course uh, know that string theory is supposed to be has a very ambitious goal of unification of all known interactions and quantum gravity, uh, and uh, of course that's caused a lot of arguments whether uh, how easy it would be to accomplish this and. Uh, uh, at the moment, I think we're not making huge amounts of progress in that direction, but uh, so it's, there are quite a few string theory skeptics these days, but one should not forget that string theory actually was invented not as a theory of everything, but as a theory of uh, strong nuclear force. So, so the strong nuclear force is very important, right? So here is a picture of a nucleus consisting of neutrons and uh, protons and of course protons have positive charge right so and the nucleus is very small of the order of a few femtometers so you would expect tremendous repulsive force between protons so so what is holding the nucleus together well of course that's the short range strong nuclear force and uh, and I'll say more about this in a moment but uh, Basically, the golden age of hadronic physics was uh, in the 50s and 60s with lots of 
uh, strongly interacting particles in addition to, uh, to protons and neutrons were discovered. And the term hadron was actually coined by Okun uh, as opposite of lepton. Apparently, hadros is, uh, uh, stands for heavy in Greek, while leptos is light, apparently. Uh, I don't know Greek, but that's what I read on Wikipedia. <laughs> so, so here is, for example, uh, one of the discoveries in the 50s was of the strange particles, new type of mesons called K-mesons. And here is a picture of a K meson decaying into three charged pi mesons. Uh, so as I mentioned, the strong nuclear force, uh, it affects all these hadrons, which form the following two classes, the baryons, which are protons, neutrons, lambda particles, and so on, and mesons, which are the lightest ones, pions, kaons, then there are vector mesons, and then there's, for example, the J psi, the, uh, the meson composed of charm, anti-charm, and so on. So by now, if you open the particle data book, there is enormous amount of data on hadronic particles. So the characteristic of the strong force is that it's very short range, but it's strong enough to oppose uh, very successfully this uh, tremendous uh, electromagnetic repulsion of protons inside the nuclei. So without the strong force, there would be no world as we know it at all. And it's very important to understand this better. And of course, uh, so as, as uh, more and more hadrons were discovered in the 50s and 60s, people started suspecting that there is some substructure to them and, and the hypothesis of quarks was advanced by Gelman and, and Zweig in the early 60s. And at that point, only uh, the, only the up-down and range quarks were known, now we are, uh, which are the relatively light ones. And now we know also the three additional relatively heavy ones. And basically what was done by Gelman, Zweig, Neyman was to uh, assume that these light quarks, there is an approximate SU3 flavor symmetry that rotates them. And then the particles, uh, hadronic particles were grouped into representations on, under that symmetry. So this is the multiplet of kaons, pions, and eta particles, the lowest baryon multiplet concentration. Uh, okay, then as time went on, more, more and more heavy mesons were discovered. And uh, so, for example, this is a multiplet of vector mesons, which includes the rho, the omega, and so on. And uh, perhaps the earliest empirical evidence for string-like structure of hadrons came from arranging them into so-called Reggie trajectory, where one plots the angular momentum versus mass squared. And the leading Reggie trajectory looks approximately linear up to sufficiently high spin. And then these additional dots here, the displaced dots correspond to, so we'll see that these are like rotational excitations uh, of, uh, of the quark and anti-quark connected by a kind of flux tube. And these contain additional vibrational excitations. So, so the leading Reggie trajectory is that of rho A2 and so on. Okay, then of course the history of true string theory kind of began in 1968 when Veneziano proposed a concrete dual amplitude for elastic pion scattering, which has a very simple, uh, simple form of a beta function. Uh, this ratio is just the beta function of uh, minus alpha of s minus alpha of t with exactly linear Reggie trajectories. Uh, and, then, uh, and then soon there was a lot of work, including the interpretation of Bynambu, Nielsen, and Susskind, independently proposing the open string interpretation where you basically think of the, these uh, mesons as kind of strings. And then they can split in the middle. And then uh, this sort of uh, joining and splitting corresponds to this four point function, four point amplitude of mesons. 
so this was the birth of bosonic string theory. Then people realized that this theory had to live in 26 dimensions and necessarily contain tachyons because of the, uh, the structure of the over, uh, this uh, intercept. So this is not, uh, not really turned out to be a great theory of, uh, of hadrons, but it's a kind of toy model. Then people were trying to improve on it to make it supersymmetric. But at the moment there is, you know, just working along that route, you're sort of led to uh, then 10 dimensional theory, which is supersymmetric. So it can't exactly be a QCD anyway. So why, <clears throat> in the meantime, the true theory of, uh, of strong interactions appeared actually pretty soon after, quite amazingly. Uh, and this true theory turned out to be just a gauge theory of uh, where basically it was realized that each flavor state of quark comes uh, in three colors. And now there is an exact SU three color symmetry, which can be promoted to local symmetry at the expense of introducing eight colored gluons. And then the Lagrangian of QCD basically emerged. So this was the true turning point in the history around 72, 73. And one uh, historic paper was a paper by a talk by Gelman called the advantages of the color octet gluons. Apparently before then the gluons were tried as color singlets, but uh, then this idea of color octet gluon emerged, which is just uh, uh, this SU3 gauge field. Uh, so, so this Lagrangian is short enough that you can put it on a t-shirt and it's truly a, you know, tremendous accomplishment. And uh, it's uh, many people regard this as a kind of perfect quantum field theory because it is asymptotically free. In other words, it's short distance behavior when you start cranking out momentum transfer, uh, you basically, uh, you realize that um, that at short distances, uh, the coupling starts falling off as uh, uh, this alpha strong is just g, g n mil squared over four pi. And that falls essentially like one over the logarithm. This is, uh, of course, this was by now honored by a Nobel Prize, but I think this is, uh, not just a Nobel Prize, it's, uh, it's a particularly outstanding Nobel Prize. Uh, so it's, it's the part of the standard model of particle physics that can stand alone. It need not be embedded in a bigger theory. And it admits a lattice definition that matches onto the asymptotic freedom while allowing the theory to be defined at longer distances. Uh, so this, uh, the, around 73, 74, 75, enormous progress was made in the conceptual story and also in the regularization of this theory. But the problem in some sense is still unsolved because at long distances, the coupling becomes very strong and uh, you cannot just use the ty type of Feynman diagrams that are used in establishing the, uh, the asymptotic freedom of, of the theory. By the way, feel free to interrupt. Uh, it uh, would be good to keep it informal. Okay, so, so this growth of the coupling led to the famous confinement problem, that, uh, which is uh, why don't we see colored particles as asymptotic states? And in particular, these colored gluons that are massless don't uh, propagate freely. If they could propagate freely, then we would see these unbound massless particles, but instead we don't see them in the spectrum of quantum chromodynamics. And they're always appear to be bound into colorless hadrons. Uh, so on very short time scales, we do see propagation of colored objects. In particular with heavy quarks, you see it unmistakably. It's you see these so-called B jets that propagate quite far, uh, but then they always effectively bind into these color singlets objects. And this is an example of a diagram with a bunch of jets that hadronize into streams of, uh, of hadrons. 
so in the end, uh, you don't you you see only colorless bound states recorded by by the detectors. So so this uh, when I was a grad student, I came to Princeton in 1982. Actually, it's amazing. 40 years ago, and back then this problem was huge. Everyone was thinking about QCD and the confinement problem, and people were trying to. Uh, to solve it somehow analytically, not just using the lattice. Uh, but I think it's still unsolved, really. Uh, and uh, so around the term, turn of the millennium, around uh, year 2000, Clay Mathematics Institute posed these uh, millennium problems. And actually, the number one problem is called the Young Mills and Mass Gap. Uh, the mass gap is just a statement that there are no massless gluons essentially running uh, as asymptotic states. Uh, and uh, this is a brief statement. There is a longer statement, but the status is still unsolved. And, uh, you know, the interest in this problem sort of uh, rises and falls. It's been kind of oscillating. Uh, but coming soon, there will be. Uh, a new effort to understand the, the sort of fundamental structure of QCD in which I'm involved and it will be called the Simon's collaboration on confinement and QCD strings. I uh, think should be should be starting this fall and will be announced soon. And uh, yeah, this is a nice uh, image uh, that was made by Grisha Tarnopolsky who will be one of the members of this collaboration. And other members include uh, David Gross and uh, Sergei Dubovsky of Araroni and uh, several other people. Uh, and basically the idea will be that uh, somehow we will try to use all the sort of triangle of approaches, the analytical theory, the computation and uh, new phenomenological results to improve our understanding of confinement and QCD strings. Uh, so so, so uh, let me just talk a bit about the numerical approaches. Or, so Wilson's big breakthrough was this lattice uh, gauge theory, where one can construct a completely regularized uh, action, uh, say for pure the uh, glue theory without quarks, you can sum over these plaquette terms, and each one is a trace of the product of link variables around the plaquette. Uh, so this is uh, still a very big effort, and we're hoping that big progress in numerical work will, uh, uh, will facilitate some new analytical insights. So now, uh, so one big, uh, one way to, criterion for confinement is the area law of the Wilson loop. Namely, if you consider a big rectangular Wilson loop and start expanding at strong coupling, basically expanding in plaquette terms, then you have to, to get a leading non-zero answer, you have to basically tile this entire big loop with elementary plaquettes. So that's why you get uh, this uh, one over G squared comes for each plaquette, and then you have to raise it to a large power, which is the area of the loop in lattice units. And that's this immediately leads to area law at strong coupling. But the strong coupling expansion is not enough. You really need to continue to weak coupling at lattice scale due to the asymptotic freedom, namely G squared at the lattice uh, spacing scale A has to really decrease like one over the log. And, uh, and the strong coupling expansion is not applicable. So this is why you really need uh, a massive numerical effort to continue from strong to weak coupling. And uh, the question that worried people a lot in the early days is can there be some kind of phase transition in the process of continuing from strong to weak coupling? Initially people, worked on small lattices, but uh, Wilson and Kreutz and others obtained some encouraging results. Uh, more recently, one can do really big lattices up to 
a hundred, at four torus with a hundred lattice sites in each direction. And, and the numerical simulation certainly suggests that the answer is no, that the confinement does not disappear as one continues to recoupling. Uh, but at the same time, there is still no like good uh, analytical handle on, on confinement. So the, the main thing that people observe and hope to observe is the confining strain or the uh, chromoelectric flux tube. Namely, if one puts heavy quark and anti-quark probes, then uh, at short distances, uh, say in quantum electrodynamics, we're used to the dipole pattern. And this should still be true at very, very short distances in QCD. But here you see how at long distances, uh, the action density gets collimated into the string-like object of some finite thickness, which is again around 10 to the minus 15 meters. So, and this, this explains the, the linear potential between quark and anti-quark and explains the area law for the Wilson loop. But this simulation is already something like 17 years old. It's available from Line Weber's website. Uh, and there are other similar simulations. And people more recently have been working on understanding the effective action for this uh, flux tube, the, which is also called the QCD string. And some very interesting new facts are emerging from that. Uh, so the picture of meson, highly excited mesons would be you basically take the string with quark and anti-quark at as endpoints and you spin it up. And then you basically get, get this uh, linear relation between J and mass squared, the spin and mass squared. And the string tension turns out to be around the GV per, per Fermi or per femtometer, which in uh, ordinary units is something like uh, 1.6 kilojoules per centimeter which is a lot of energy, but uh, we don't know how to harness it because you cannot stretch this string that far due to the snapping of the string due to quark anti-quark creation. So while in pure glue theory, the string can get arbitrarily long in real world, it, it keeps sort of snapping in the middle and we cannot produce a significant stretching of the string. Uh, then there are also baryonic objects, which, uh, which necessarily contain the so-called wide junction. There will be a wide junction uh, uh, somewhere in the middle. And I think the understanding of this wide junction is not as good yet as of the confining string. So one, one thing that uh, again was a big breakthrough in the around 74 was the idea of generalizing from three colors to n colors and then making large. This is called the Hoft large n limit where you keep g squared n fixed as n goes to infinity and this uh, lambda is a Hoft coupling. Then, uh, so one advantage is, of it, uh, is that the snapping of a flux tube gets suppressed uh, and also the emission of a closed string through self-intersection kind of gets suppressed. Uh, uh, and that's uh, the, another way to see the simplification is that only the planar diagrams uh, contribute, but it still does not appear to be a solvable problem. Nevertheless, this uh, suppression of the snapping of the string is a valuable kind of conceptual tool. So. So for example, if, if n were not three, but were, I don't know, 33, there would be no mistake at all that string theory is a good description of, uh, of strong interactions because these Reggie trajectories would continue to much higher spin. While in real world, the resonance is already for, I don't know, spin, uh, uh, five or something, they, they get very broad and hard to identify. So somehow nature didn't hand us a very easy problem to solve with SU3, but we can 
try to think about what the world would look like with a larger number of colors. And actually one of the efforts that's going on in lettuce theory is to uh, not limit simulations to SU3, but continue them to much higher values of N and continue them to infinite and limit and try to see if that theory somehow looks more analytically tractable uh, than, uh, than the SU3 theory. That's sort of one of the, for example, Asanadora and Tapper have been doing a lot of work on that. Okay, so that's, that's basically the situation for LQCD, um, but uh, there was uh, a lot of return to these ideas around uh, 26, 27 years ago, uh, due to just uh, progress in supersymmetric theory. And some uh, very interesting results were obtained, not for QCD, but for supersymmetric cousins of QCD using uh, the tool of Dirichlet brains. So Dirichlet brains are objects in 10 dimensional superstring theory, which uh, are connected by open strings. And then if one construct, uh, considers a stack of n coincident Dirichlet three brains, it turns out that this theory kind of houses the maximal supersymmetric SUN gauge theory in four dimensions. But then uh, the metric produced by this curve background is uh, the so-called uh, three brain metric has this amazing feature that that small r, it just approaches the product of a five dimensional sphere and five dimensional negatively curved space. And the other amazing thing is that uh, uh, the radius of the space is related, is uh, proportional to Toft coupling to the power one quarter. So you can think of it as a kind of kaluza klein compactification of 10-dimensional supergravity on a five-dimensional sphere. So as you probably heard, there was this kaluza klein idea of adding an extra circle. Uh, here we're adding an extra five-dimensional sphere and everything um, works very nicely. And so this uh, dual description of um, Strongly coupled Young Mills theory by by IDS five crosses five supergravity is absolutely taken over at least the world of our section of the archive. <laughs> it's been uh, something like uh, twenty seven years of where it seems like half of the papers have ADS in them, which is in itself a pretty remarkable phenomenon. It's a kind of limit cycle. Or, uh, so, so this ADS CFT duality, uh, it's actually more general than this maximalist supersymmetric theory. Uh, although that is the most, the simplest example, one can, uh, in general, uh, basically one of the reasons people are so fascinated of it is that just essentially Einstein gravity can somehow incorporate something about strongly coupled gauge theory. And uh, this is an illustration of a negatively curved space tiled by cows. This is supposed to be a joke uh, instead of a spherical cow, which is a spherical cow is a kind of toy model. This is a hyperbolic cow. This is from a sort of semi-popular article that Maldacena and I wrote. Uh, and this is just a, a somewhat awkward representation of what negatively curved uh, two-dimensional space looks like. And now we have to do it in five dimensions instead of two, and we got ADS space. So this, uh, this duality is by now very well tested and, uh, and people have, uh, succeeded in sort of extrapolating the usual Feynman diagram techniques that are valid at small lambda to large lambda and confirming that they agree with gravity, at least in some cases. And in other cases, gravity gives basically sensible predictions for what the behavior at very strong G squared N is. But the caveat is that this theory is not asymptotically free. Essentially, once you fix 
g squared n at some scale, it remains the same at all scales. So the behavior of this model is rather different from that of QCD. And, uh, and this should be a motivation to still do better and try to solve uh, more QCD-like theories than this one. Uh, so one example of how it's different from QCD is the computation of, of the quark anti-quark potential, which is done essentially by placing quark anti-quark at the boundary of five dimensional ADS space. And the prescription is uh, due to Maldacena is to connect, let uh, solve for the shape of the string, uh, connecting the quark and anti-quark as it sort of dips into the extra fifth dimension. Uh, but because of the exact scale invariance of the theory, you find that the this quark anti-quark potential is exactly coulombic, even at strong coupling, which is very different from what we saw in QCD, right? In QCD, we saw that uh, if you go back to what the, it looks like in QCD, the string forms, it really becomes linear very quickly. So that's a big difference between this uh, ADS, this n equal four supersymmetric gauge theory and QCD. And one question is, can we do something closer to QCD, incorporate the formation of this flux tube? And uh, in a nutshell, what needs to happen, as I think emphasized early on by, by Polyakov, was that while near the boundary, the metric is close to anti the sitter, there should be some kind of infrared wall. Uh, and that this infrared wall, the warp factor A of Z should, uh, should basically stay uh, finite. And then the string, as you remove quark and anti-quark further, the string will just stretch along this, uh, be located here and stretch along this uh, distance between quark and anti-quark. And then you, you get, so then what happens is that the fundamental string located at the infrared wall plays the role of the confining string. But can one find a more sort of fundamental model where this happens? And this uh, I worked on for many years and in fact worked uh, with uh, various people, including Strassler, Taitlin Strassler, and later with Demarski. Uh, so basically to break uh, con uh, conformal, it's possible to adjust the brain configuration to break conformal invariance. Uh, and then uh, the metric that you get, so you have to consider deep brains on the very simple Calabria space called the conifold. Uh, and this conifold gets deformed into this very simple algebraic geometric equation, sum of zi squared equal epsilon squared. The metric on this space is uh, well known. It can be written down explicitly. And you find that uh, the presence of additional fields creates a very simple metric with a warp factor, which does not vanish at the bottom of this conifold. So that's like a whole separate uh, lecture on its own to explain how this works, but, but it looks like a consistent model where uh, far in the infrared, you do get confining behavior. And one can, for example, calculate the quark anti-quark potential very simply. In fact, this was the work of an undergraduate student who did this. Uh, and you do find a transition from Coulombic behavior to linear behavior for the quark anti-quark potential. And for comparison, here is the plot in real world QCD. Uh, the plot is, uh, this was done by Bali, I think around 20 years ago. Uh, the Cornell potential is essentially the one that interpolates between one over R and, uh, and uh, sigma R. And you see that you get qualitatively very similar behavior from, from this uh, warp deformed conifold, people call it warp throat and this, uh, uh, and what happens in real QCD. So at least this is a model of confinement. Uh, 
And furthermore, it's interesting to study, basically study perturbations of this relatively simple metric. And then you get a discrete spectrum of bound states, the glue balls. This is something that uh, uh, Dima Milnikov worked on a lot. And uh, it's a very interesting mathematical problem in its own right. And it gives uh, families of, of tightly bound glue balls. Uh, so so we, the spectrum is basically discrete. There are also some very interesting massless bound states that are related to some special symmetry breaking patterns of this particular model. So it's an amusing model, which people also try to apply to cosmology and particle physics. And, uh, and you can say that it gives a kind of physicist proof of confinement. But the problem is that it's still not completely QCD-like in the sense that in this solution, the, the coupling still stays strong throughout the RG flow. And, uh, and you cannot say that far in the UV, the coupling becomes weak. So, so it's not an example of asymptotically free uh, theory from which confinement arises. So, so we still, so one thing that we're still lacking in spite of 27 or something years of work on these type of phenomena is how to describe asymptotically free theories and then transition to strong coupling and confinement. And this I think is part of the reason why some of us are still excited to understand uh, confinement better also from the point of view of the gauge gravity duality. Okay, so that, that is uh, sort of uh, the status of this situation. Uh, and now in the remaining uh, remainder of the talk, I'll talk briefly about some, in some sense, even more modest attempts uh, to understand confinement in uh, one plus one dimensional gauge theories. And they lead to some interesting surprises, which, uh, which I'll talk about, but... Uh, in case there are questions, uh, feel free to ask. Okay, well, if not, let's just, so long before gauge gravity duality, uh, one of the first models which incorporated confinement, well, maybe the very first was the Schwinger model, which is just the one plus one dimensional QED. And that model uh, there, the charges are basically held together in one plus one dimension just by the Coulomb force. And the Coulomb force in one spatial dimension is just linear. So just the perturbative uh, Coulomb force is already creating a kind of string that holds, holds the charge and anti-charge together. And interestingly, the Schwinger model is still attracting a lot of attention, but I won't talk about it now. But then a somewhat more complicated model is the uh, one plus one dimensional SUN gauge theory coupled to fermion and the fundamental representation. And Toft, uh, this was the first sort of attempt by Toft to apply his large end philosophy uh, and solve this model. So, so basically, again, skipping the details, you essentially find that if you go, uh, this, the simple thing that happens is that there are only quark anti-quark states. The splitting is suppressed, so you only have a quark anti-quark, and there is a wave function of q q bar state phi of x, where x is the momentum fraction of the quark. Namely, it ranges from zero to one. And Toft derived this beautiful integral equation. This is actually straight from his paper for this function phi of x. And alpha one and alpha two are just the mass uh, parameters related to the masses of the quark and this different mass of the anti quark. And this is the principal value integral here. Then you can solve this equation numerically and for a given mass, you can obtain this sort of single trajectory of uh, single trajectory of uh, bound states. Uh, for massless quark, you do see a massless bound state here. 
but uh, but if you make the quark massive, then even the first bound state is massive, and then you get an approximately linear relation between uh, approximately linear relation between the excitation number and the mass squared. So it's a very beautiful model, which has been used repeatedly many, many times. It's a classic soluble two-dimensional model, but it, in some ways it's again, not very QCD-like because it totally lacks the adjoint degrees of freedom. Essentially all that you have in this, this Toft equation are just uh, quark and anti-quark and there are no dynamical gluons because uh, you you can essentially, all, all you get is just a kind of Coulombic force in one plus one dimension. And this already 30 years ago prompted me and uh, Simon Dolly, who was a postdoc at the time at Princeton to simply try to add by hand a joint matter to, to the QCD, namely add an adjoint scalar or an adjoint fermion. And, and the model with an adjoint fermion, a Majorana fermion turns out to be particularly nice in many ways. So I'll stick to this model. You can think of it as a kind of toy model for a Gluino. So this model is super normalizable and in some ways even finite because the mass of this fermion is protected by a chiral symmetry. So, so for example, you can ask what happens with this M equals zero model. This is a Lagrangian for the joint Majorana fermion. And uh, you can say it's set M to zero and ask what happens to this model. And the usual intuition that people would have is that any model in one plus one dimension would be confining, right? Because in one plus one dimension, you just have a kind of Coulomb force that rises linearly. But the fact is that this model actually is not confining. And that's uh, an interesting surprise. Um, so we already got some hints of this surprise many years ago, but more recently, I think it's been understood better. In some sense, what happens is that these massless fermions, uh, adjoint fermions can kind of renormalize the string tension to zero. Uh, so, so I don't have time to dis explain all the reasoning of, uh, of this model. We initially were just solving a model with only joints and we're solving for what you can call Gluino balls, namely bound states of Gluinos. But then uh, a little more than a year ago with uh, Silvio Pufo and uh, his student Ross Dempsey, we studied the model where in addition to the to an adjoint, we also add the fundamental quark, fundamental uh, fermion or a quark uh, with a different mass. And then we can sort of uh, send M adjoint to zero while keeping M fundamental very large. By large, we mean heavy compared to the scale of G young mills which in one plus one dimension has dimensions of mass. So basically M fundamental over G will be made large. And then you can think of this as a kind of probe quark. Uh, and then study the tension of the string connected, uh, connecting probe quark and anti-quark. Uh, so uh, so th this model can also be attacked to using light cone technique similar to what Hoft did, but it's really much harder because uh, there can be pair, now you have dynamical adjoints inside the string and they can pair create. So for example, a state with Q bar Q and no adjoint quanta can mix with two, with four, with six and so on. So it's really becomes an infinitely mixed problem. So you no longer have the luxury of just having this one simple equation. You really have, uh, in some sense, an infinitely mixed problem. And that, that is more QCD-like because you do expect uh, multiple Regi trajectories and uh, exponential growth in the number of states that, that you have in this problem. 
so we already studied this in, back in the early 90s, but then we reconsidered it with uh, heavier precision. And, and there is something pretty amazing that happens at zero adjoint mass, that there are some extra kind of symmetries or uh, there is some cut smoothie algebra that emerges that makes it, that in some sense is responsible for lack of confinement and the screening phase of the theory. So just to give you an idea without explanation, here are the spectra of, uh, that you get in this discretized, the numerical spectra that you get by discretizing the, the problem, introducing a so-called DLCQ, discretized life cone quantization uh, for mesons. So for example, uh, this is, uh, we set the quark mass to be something, and then there are no massless mesons. The, the spectra of uh, sort of quark anti-quark states start at some level, but then uh, interestingly, you can see that there is a continuum kind of developing already right above it. This is not what you would expect from a confining theory because you would expect that there is a mass gap above the slightest state. So somehow what happens is that this quark anti-quark state falls apart into a screened quark and a screened anti-quark. And uh, uh, so there are various ways to try to think about it. There is also sort of a more mathematical way due to Zohar Kamargotsky and others uh, having to do with some uh, non-invertible topological lines in this theory, which I don't understand very well. But you can just see it from the spectrum that, that there is no confinement. And in fact, uh, yeah, I'm, I can't tell you all the details in this short talk, but the reason all these points are blue is that because their masses are exactly explained by composite states of non-interacting screened quark and screened anti-quark. So, so we're confident that as you go to, uh, to more and more sort of higher resolution, this continuum will really develop above, above this line. So this is the spectrum for fermionic states, namely where there is Q bar Q and one, three, five, seven, odd number of these uh, Luinos inside it. There, are also, there is also a separate bosonic sector where there are two, four, six, et cetera. And this is the spectrum there. You see that the continuum begins at basically exactly the same value with the numerical resolution, but then there is also a bound state below the continuum. Uh, and that, that is really corresponding to Q and Q bar being bound uh, as a sort of compact bound state. Uh, so all this evidence from the spectra suggests the following quark anti-quark potential that at short distances, it starts out linear, but then these massless, uh, massless uh, gluinos kind of screen it and then it levels off at some finite. Uh, finite height. And of course, above this finite height, you will see the falling apart of the quark and anti-quark. So, so, and, but the, the, the fact that there is a short distance attraction explains why there is this uh, bound state below, below the threshold. Okay, so this is uh, what we have. So basically the, uh, the massless adjoints manage to renormalize string tension exactly to zero. So the theory is not confining. As soon as you turn on the adjoint mass, what you see is that instead of exactly flat potential, you get sl small slope of order adjoint mass. And you basically restore weak confinement. So, so the model where M adjoint over G young mills is small is a kind of model of very weak confinement here. Okay, so, so that's pretty much one of the things that uh, we've been doing. There are 
various other things, but one lesson from this uh, seemingly simple model, which is still not exactly solvable, is uh, don't take confinement for granted. Even in one plus one dimensions, we now know that there are these uh, screening models and the screening is still somewhat mysterious how it works in this model. But, but I think it's okay to say that, that these massless adjoins somehow managed to renorm provide the renormalization of the string tension to zero at long distances. Uh, of course, it would be better to understand it without light cone gauge, understand it better, say, from the usual standard lattice simulations and so on. So there's still quite a lot of work to do even in this simple model. Needless to say, proof of color confinement would be very important to have in two plus one and three plus one dimensions and improved connections between QCD strings and fundamental strings. Uh, and the perennial question of can we solve large and pure glue theory is, uh, is uh, also still looming large. And for many years, people have uh, been talking about it. So, so we hope uh, as part of this new collaboration to have renewed efforts guided by numerical results on large and extrapolation of numerical results and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Igor, for a very interesting talk. So let us thank Igor for this uh, presentation. And uh, let me see if there are any questions. So there's one question from Unicamp here. So please go ahead. Hi. Oh, sorry, I did not, I did not log in under oh. my name. It's Hi, Georgia. Georgia. So, yeah, it's Georgia Torrieri, and I found out that I logged in with the director's account. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask sort of for me, a very intuitive picture of confinement is, um, is the Gribov one with, you know, uh, at large distances, the good, it's, di it's difficult to distinguish between gauge excitations and gauge invariant excitations. And basically only the gauge invariant states remain in the partition function and what you would call the string is sort of the ultraviolet remnant of this. I mean, and the related thing is the kugo Ojima formula where the ghost diverges. I just found this really intuitive in, in a sense, sort of mathematically, maybe I'm wrong. What is the status of this? And is there a holographic sort of counterpart to this? Is there a, is there a way to, in yeah, that's, thanks for your comment. I, I don't know of any holographic parts, uh, counterpart to this argument. I mean, of course, this uh, 50 years of work on confinement have produced a variety of good arguments. They're also uh, somewhat dimension dependent. For example, in compact QED in three dimensions, we know that um, instantons really produce confinement but it's not true in uh, four dimensions. So I think a lot of people like this uh, abelian projection and uh, the monopole condensation arguments, but yeah, I, I don't know which of it is, uh, I, there is no sense that some, any of it is completely nailed down with, uh, yeah, so, so I don't, yeah, I don't know the answer. Uh, other questions? Meanwhile, uh, I wanted to ask about, uh, so you mentioned some numerical studies that uh, um, while well, trying to find the phase transition between confined and deconfined phase, and, and mm -hmm. apparently, as I said, early results were optimistic, but the present ones uh, say that there's no phase transition. So what, what does it mean? So is it, uh, does it well, mean that there's, there's a crossover or just they haven't reached the, the, the coupling? With yeah, I, me I meant just what I meant was if you work at, if you go back to the sort of strong coupling expansion and then just continue to 
from the strong coupling where you can really see analytically that there is area law. And then you start continuing G to basically going to bigger lattices and continuing G to a smaller value. Do you, do you ever lose the area law? I mean, I think that's the key question. Do, do you lose the area law as you extrapolate the theory to the regime where you see the asymptotic freedom? So it's not like a physic. I think here you don't want to see a phase transition. You just want to see a smooth extrapolation from, from the strong coupling limit to the weak coupling limit. And all numerical evidence is that it's, it works. I think it goes back already to the mid seventies. People already saw that they could sort of see some. Yeah, I think the reason it turned out to be a bit easier is uh, then maybe initially people expected is that in the quark anti quark potential, the linear regime sets in at very short distance already. You don't need to go to 10 Fermi to see the linear regime. I think you, you see that uh, if, you, if you go back to like the plot, yeah, you see that, for example, R not, I think R not is around I don't know, Fermi. You you already see that one Fermi is pretty. So so it's a kind of early onset. Like there is confinement already at quite weak coupling. Uh, but but for some reason, yeah, there is no complete proof of it. Uh, yeah, I think it would be interesting to revisit some of the old arguments from the from the really old days and see. But I think what we're looking for is maybe not so much a rigorous proof as just improved understanding of what is going on in physical terms and even quantitative uh, improvements. And of course, at finite temperature, people do see the deconfinement transition. And then it depends on like how many quarks you take and what dimension, whether it's first order or second order. Okay, uh, yeah, I have another question. This is about Reggie behavior. And we also mentioned uh, lattice results of uh, Athenador and Tepper. And the, in some other groups also trying to extrapolate the results mm -hmm. of Argen. And mm -hmm. it seems like really, well, there's certain observables that are, in fact, n independent, and you can compare results for small n, and they're almost the same, like like the global masses, for example. They, they look pretty much consistent. And I was wondering if um, you can you can say something about uh, rigid trajectories, because I think the rigid trajectories for, uh, in particular for fine energy scattering for Palmeron and so on, they, they're still I think not yet confirmed at this moment. Yeah, so yeah. What's going on. yeah, I think the this is indeed like something lattice people view as a very important thing uh, to develop because I think on a lattice you can't identify the higher spin states so well. Right? And because and you, you don't have the full the full translation uh, rotation and variance. So so to identify like these uh, the sort of continuation to higher spin, you need to do, you know, to do more, more careful at this work. But indeed, I mean, this is something people are working on. And from the lattice point of view, you only know, I think, pretty low spins so far. And, and matching even the, the notion of Reggie slope from that calculation to to what we see phenomenologically would be apparently interesting. So, so my question was also about holography. If, if you think, uh, if you know any results that somehow are useful and, because uh, I think in, in, the, in the earlier days, we tried to understand whether there is uh, uh, rigid behavior, but the problem is that in holography, if, you, if you're in the gravity regime, you only see the lightest states on the region. That's right, that's right. You have to, so no, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if there's any progress in photography. Yeah, I think in gravity, the there will be sort of very heavy states that certainly observe uh, obey the Reggie behavior just from the spinning string at the bottom of 
the throat. But they will be not the states that that you compute from supergravity. I mean, in some sense, these models from gravity, they give you like these very tightly bound glue balls whose masses are much lower than the string scale, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, these are somewhat different from the type of behavior you see in the, these lattice models, I think. But yeah, maybe improving the bridge between those two, two things would again be very good. I see a question from Tiago. Tiago, please. Hi. Uh, thanks for the for the talk, Igor. Uh, I have a question about the KCD string that you mentioned. If if I remember correct, that uh, people add uh, an axiom to this KCD string. That's basically. right. That's right. Yeah. It, was it uh, what was the motivation and uh, is it uh, well understood and, uh... i think it's actually on very solid footing now uh, and you basically just from you study what they do is they study energy levels of a say of a string wrapped around uh, some compact dimension a three plus one dimensional gauge theory they know how to do this and uh, in two plus one dimensions, you don't need this extra massive mode. Everything matches very well to just an Ambu theory with small corrections. Mm. But uh, yeah, this is where the talks that uh, Dubovsky always gives or Tepper, they see very, very sharp evidence for this massive extra massive mode. And sort of that's one of the progresses that we hope to build on. Uh, you can think of it, I mean, this, for the very long string, this mode is like a resonance because there are these sort of fluctuations of the QCD string, the Goldstone bosons, and they can create this massive resonance. So people who do S matrix on the QCD string actually also see some other evidence for this uh, massive mode. The question is, is it the only massive mode or there is a whole new, whole family of massive residences that you need? Yeah, that's a very fascinating thing. Like it's a kind of understanding the fine structure of this QCD string that was not possible until it really came from, from a much improved numerical understanding of the energy levels of a long wrapped QCD string. So that, that is uh, concrete progress. Okay, so I may, may, maybe I have a follow-up. So you also mentioned that the Y junction is sort of complicated. Do we learn something new with this improved models? Results about it? Yeah, the Y junction uh, at the zeroth order level, there is some energy sitting at the junction, right? And I know, I know that in, uh, and I'm in a logical, oops, sorry. Yeah, uh, so in fact, for one thing I didn't mention is the new discoveries of exotic tetra quarks. And these tetra quarks are a bit like baryonium states, apparently they're a bit like BB bar. That's one way to think about them. and. They, they contain the white junction. So, uh, so understanding better like uh, how much energy is contained in the junction from first principles is apparently important for stability of uh, these exotic. Uh, the, one, the one other nice thing about hadronic physics is that at LHC, uh, people did discover a whole bunch of surprising hadronic states and and the theoretical explanation for many of them is still very not uh, not mature i think yeah. i think there's another question from georgia georgia please hi yeah um is there anything from heavy ion phenomenology that you would say has impacted um you know, fundamental study of confinement because there was a lot of data from, you know, 
the search for quark gluon plasma, in many ways, it's it, there, there is a lot of results, but they're sort of in a direction that people did not expect, like, you know, the perfect fluidity and such, um, which is not directly related to confinement, or maybe it is, but yeah. Just yeah, no, I think, I mean, at least the, the possibility of the seeing the deconfined state, the plasma state, that's, of course, very important in itself, right? And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there was, of course, the hopes for this comparison with uh, supersymmetric young mills and sort of the plateau in the equation of state and all. Yeah, I'm not totally sure what the latest status of it is, but, but I think the heavy ion experiments should be, the, the one thing that where there will be definitely experimental connection is from, uh, from this electron ion collider, because they will do a very precise sort of proton tomography, like study the proton bound state by scattering electrons from it. And essentially study the wave function of the proton experimentally. And uh, that, that should be ready to begin in nine years or so. That, that is a very concrete thing. But I think the heavy ion results, I mean, uh, I mean, they're useful also for also producing, hopefully, in heavy ion collision, some of these exotic states. But just sharpening the understanding of of QCD at finite temperature and chemical potential that's that's I think very valuable should be yeah I mean the picture is uh, of course there are like literally tens of thousands of papers on all these issues but th there is sort of a feeling as you say that the field has not converged to something often that we can really say is completely agreed on by, by the community. And, and I hope that, I mean, the collaboration will be initially just four years. So there, there is only so much we can do in four years, but I uh, just ho hope to clarify some of the, at least the status of some of the problems. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Igor. Uh, it was an interesting discussion. So, um, well, so here we close the another seminar of our series. Thank you very much for contributing, Igor. And mm -hmm. we expect to see you again next week with more seminars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, thanks for the good questions. And uh, thank you.